This podcast is officially two years old today. Through the last two years, we have covered a lot of topics. Diabetes, blood sugar management, heart, gut, brain, cancer, weight loss, exercise, sleep, stress management, supplements, labs, fasting, mindset, and so much more. So now I want to know from you, what topics do you want more of? I will leave my email address in the description of this show. Send me all of your requests. In honor of this two-year anniversary, I'm bringing back some of the most popular episodes that you may have missed. First up is the topic of pre-diabetes. This is a tremendously common condition that sadly millions have no idea they have. I hope you enjoy reviewing this popular episode. Pre-diabetes symptoms and causes. Pre-diabetes is a condition in which the body becomes less sensitive to the effects of insulin, insulin resistance. This process occurs over many years or even decades before blood sugars start to rise consistently. Statistics in the United States show that over 50% of the adult population have diabetes or pre-diabetes. You may not think this applies to you if you're not overweight but nearly one third of normal weight adults fall into this category as well. In fact, research has shown that only 12% of the adult population have optimal levels of the top five markers for metabolic disorders, blood sugar, blood pressure, waist circumference, high density lipoproteins or HDL cholesterol and triglycerides. But let's back up a bit and talk about blood sugar, insulin, and the two main types of diabetes, blood sugar and insulin. Blood sugar simply refers to the amount of sugar or glucose in your blood, mostly due to the foods that you consume. Glucose is the primary source of energy for your body's cells. The hormone insulin helps you move the glucose from the blood into your cells where it can be used for energy. Both blood sugar levels that are too high or too low can be toxic to the body. We'll talk more later about what causes the spikes and drops in blood sugar values. Diabetes and prediabetes. Diabetes is a disease that is most known for its effects on blood sugar levels though there are many other common symptoms and disorders associated. There are two main types of diabetes, type one and type two. Type one diabetes is an autoimmune condition in which the body does not produce insulin due to an attack on and destruction of the insulin producing cells in the pancreas. Insulin is a hormone with many roles, one of which is to usher sugar from the blood into the cells of the body to be used for energy production. Type two diabetes is the most common form of diabetes, and it occurs when the body does not use insulin properly due to insulin resistance. Type two diabetes is first a condition of insulin being too high and therefore toxic. Much like drug users need more and more of a drug to elicit the same high, the body can become less responsive to the presence of insulin, meaning it takes more and more insulin to get the sugar into the cells and out of the blood. Over time, often many years, insulin continually fails to complete this task, continues to be produced in higher and higher amounts, and ultimately, can't get the sugar into the cells. This leads to elevations in blood sugar. So how is diabetes diagnosed? Type two diabetes progression can take many years. The conventional medical community has standards when they will diagnose a patient with prediabetes or diabetes based on various laboratory markers. Hemoglobin A1C. This is a blood test that determines the amount of sugar that has been added to your red blood cells. This is used to indicate the average blood sugar values that you've had over the last two to three months, which is based on the average lifespan of your red blood cells. 
They typically live about two to three months. For this marker, below 5.7% is considered normal. Between 5.7 and 6.4 is considered pre-diabetes and 6.5% or higher on two separate blood tests would indicate full type two diabetes. Fasting blood sugar. This is a blood test usually taken in the morning following an overnight fast with no food or calories being consumed for at least eight hours. On this test, values less than 100 milligrams per deciliter is considered normal. Optimal values would actually be between 70 and 90. 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter is diagnosed pre-diabetes. And values 126 milligrams per deciliter or higher on two separate tests is a diagnosis of diabetes. Some doctors may also run other tests such as random blood sugar or oral glucose tolerance tests. The random blood sugar test is a blood test that evaluates blood sugars without regard to when you last ate. So they're not in a fasted state. Values at greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher suggests diabetes. Now the oral glucose tolerance test is more commonly used during pregnancy, but it has grown in popularity with some medical professionals. On this test, you do fast overnight, and then in the doctor's office, you consume a sugary solution. The blood sugar levels are then tested periodically over the next two hours. Values less than 140 milligrams per deciliter are considered normal. 140 to 199 milligrams per deciliter are diagnosed as pre-diabetes and values at 200 milligrams per deciliter or higher after two hours suggests full type two diabetes. Unfortunately, none of these tests are looking at insulin, which is the first marker to increase in the progression of diabetes. A comprehensive panel is far more informative for overall metabolic health. So here are the markers that I recommend to more fully assess diabetes and prediabetes. Fasting glucose, the test we've already discussed. A full lipid panel that includes total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and triglycerides. A fasting insulin so that we can really see what those insulin values are doing and detect insulin resistance much earlier. Uric acid, which is related to high levels of insulin. LDH, which is related to tissue damage that can often accompany diabetes and prediabetes diagnoses. A complete blood count, or CBC, with differential, which is related to the types of red blood cells, white blood cells, and other immune markers in your body. And a comprehensive metabolic panel, or CMP, which tests various electrolytes, kidney markers, and liver markers. So what are the causes of diabetes progression? Well, we've already established that type two diabetes originates from high insulin levels, but what causes those high insulin levels? Insulin is released primarily due to increased blood sugar. Blood sugar increases the most with consumption of carbohydrates, although it can moderately rise with protein consumption as well. The least impact on blood sugar comes from dietary fat. So if consuming dietary carbohydrates cause the largest blood sugar spike and therefore the largest insulin rise, cutting back on carbohydrates would be the easiest and quickest solution to lowering both blood sugars and insulin. Unfortunately, many in the medical community are still recommending 40 to 60% of your overall daily intake be from carbohydrates with an emphasis on low fat foods, even for those with diagnosed type two diabetes or prediabetes. But fat has the least capacity to raise blood sugars and insulin levels and carbohydrates have the most capacity to raise blood sugars. This is totally illogical and frankly, dangerous advice. 
cutting carbohydrates is the fastest and most sustainable way to lower blood sugars and insulin levels. And it can happen quickly. Of course, this is a long-term strategy. If you go back to eating 40 to 60% carbohydrates, your blood sugars and insulin values will climb again. The great news is research has shown that compliance with a lower carbohydrate diet can be very high over the long run, more so than very low calorie diets or post-bariatric surgery diets. So there's one other major impact on blood sugar and insulin values, and that is stress. Stress can also cause blood sugar rises due to cortisol release. Cortisol is our primary stress hormone, which causes the body to release stored sugars so that we have enough energy to deal with whatever the immediate threat is. This rise in blood sugar ultimately leads to a rise in insulin because most of the threats today don't actually require any physical movement. We aren't actually running from tigers today. We are sitting and stewing over emotional and psychological stressors, or we're dealing with biological stressors like toxins, poor diet, sedentary lifestyle, and chronic inflammation. These do not require the same level of energy, but the body doesn't know the difference between stresses that need the rush of glucose and stresses that we're just dwelling in. They all get the added sugar. So let's talk a little bit about the medications and traditional treatments of diabetes and prediabetes. There are numerous medications available to the medical community to be prescribed for prediabetes and diabetes treatment. Unfortunately, the vast majority of these medications do not actually deal with the root cause of the disease. Unfortunately, the vast majority of these medications do not deal with the root cause of the disease, which is frequent consumption of blood sugar spiking foods causing frequent insulin elevations, but rather they work to lower blood sugars artificially. Some of these medications actually provide added insulin or make the body more sensitive to insulin. Now this sounds like a good thing, But insulin is an energy storage hormone. It causes weight gain, especially fat. These drugs have been found to dramatically increase cardiovascular disease risk, among many other significant downsides. Artificially lowering blood sugar isn't the solution. Rather, lowering insulin is. Now, some of the other medications block the body from producing glucose from stored materials. These do not cause the weight gain or increase cardiovascular disease risks, but still do not deal with the root cause of the disease, which is consuming foods that spike blood sugars and therefore spike insulin. These also do not reduce overall insulin impact. Lastly, some medications block the kidneys from being able to reabsorb glucose back into the body. This does effectively lower blood sugar by allowing you to more effectively eliminate sugar via the urine. This still doesn't directly correct the root cause, which is the diet, but does not lead to weight gain or increased cardiovascular disease risk and may actually help with weight loss. It doesn't directly lower insulin values, but can help keep them from spiking too high by more effectively eliminating glucose. Unfortunately, nearly all of these medications put you on a one-way street toward disease progression. None of them are dealing with the true root cause, but simply help to remedy the disease symptoms and lower some of the immediate risks. Over time, these medications will become less effective and you'll either need higher doses, different or stronger medications, or multiple medications. Not only does this cost you your health and vitality, but these are often very expensive medications, adding up to thousands of dollars yearly. Why not switch directions and deal with the true root cause the diet and lifestyle factors that are contributing to chronically elevated blood sugars that cause the chronically elevated insulin levels. 
This is the way to optimal health that lasts. If this sounds like you, I am here to help.